Hello everyone and welcome to the ACNC's webinar today on for animal welfare charities titled Staying on Track Animal Welfare Charities. You have three presenters today. My name's Matt Cry and I'm from the Education and Guidance team here at the ACNC and with me is Beth Strike, who works in the advice area of ACNC. Hello Beth. Hi guys, how are you doing? And Julia, oh, I'm going to get your surname wrong, I know it, Bilak. Correct, well done. <laughs> Hi everyone. Who is from Compliance here at the ACNC. So we've got um, two eminent experts um, for you to hear all you need to hear about staying on track as a registered charity. Also, we have a couple of colleagues answering your questions via text as we go in the other room. That's Alex and Amanda. So as you type in some questions throughout the webinar, the answers you get back via text will on your go to webinar control panel will be from either Alex or Amanda. Um, I think that's enough from me for the time being. So I'll let Beth take over for the moment. Beth, can you let everyone know what they are going to learn about today? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so today we're going to look at some information um, that we know about animal welfare charities. So just some statistics um, about the sorts of organisations that we class as animal welfare charities. Um, we're going to go through some of the types of concerns that ACNC receives about um, animal charities, uh, some common issues that are faced specifically for animal welfare charities. We'll look at a few case studies um, we'll talk about what you can do, um, and then, as Matt mentioned, we'll have a, a questions and answer. Yeah, right. So if you've got if you've got some questions, yeah, yeah, you can hold off until the end of the formal presentation because who knows your question might be answered as we go through it. So that's one option. Um, okay, lots to cover today. Uh, first, let's get into some just some interesting um, information about the animal welfare charity sector, if we could call it that. Beth, what is there to know about the animal? welfare charities in Australia? <laughs> so firstly, when we talk about animal welfare charities, we're specifically referring to not-for-profit organisations that are registered with ACNC, whose main purpose is the prevention and relief of suffering of animals, so animal welfare charities. Um, there's around 800 in total that we have registered. Um, for the statistics that we're about to look at, we've taken about 500 of those charities, specifically that focus on companion animals or domestic animals, dogs, cats, that kind of thing, yep. um, rather than broader native wildlife. Um, right. But they're still included in the broader scope. Um, specifically that we're looking in, generally can be involved in more than one activity like running a shelter, a sanctuary, animal rehabilitation or rehoming. Um, so that's what we're talking about when we say the four R's. The four R's there. Yeah, rescue, rehabilitation, rehoming and research. Okay, and what about the location and, and the, yeah, the so structure of these organisations? If you look at the graphs there, um, there's a few interesting statistics. If you like stats like me, you'll see that um, most of the animal welfare charities, the 500 that we've assessed, are located in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. And that's pretty representative of the broader charity spec, uh, sector as a whole as well. You'll find most of the charities operate from those locations. Yeah, right. And that's kind of typical just because of where the population is yeah. dispersed. So there's no surprises in terms of location. Legal structure. Um, so charity's legal structure affects its identity, um, governance structure and compliance obligations. So unincorporated tend to be smaller organisation, sort of informal. They don't have a legal identity per se, um, whereas incorporated or companies are more formalised and might have more governance structures in place. Animal welfare charities, typically, there's a higher number of incorporated associations um, than the broader charity sector, which is an interesting interesting little statistic there. Yeah, right. Okay. And um, just before we move on, um, we've got a little, I, I guess a lot of the uh, audience here is um, familiar with this structure. Many of them will be incorporated associations so, so, in yeah. this, one of those larger states. Although, no, we're speaking to audience from all over the country. All over the country. Um, we do have a quick poll to get you thinking about um, uh, animal welfare charities and, and dealing with the ACNC. One that, just a couple of questions for you. We'll give you a few seconds to answer each one. It's not difficult, so you don't need that much time. But we've got um, a little poll asking about whether or not you have 
had um, any questions, uh, concerns raised about your organisation. So if you could take a few seconds to, to answer that one. The question being, have you ever raised a concern about an animal welfare charity or had one raised about your animal welfare charity? And you've got four options. Yes, I've raised a concern about one, not necessarily yours. Yes, I've had one raised about the charity I'm involved with, neither, or both. So a couple of seconds just to answer that one and we'll see what, um, what results we get. I'll give you a few seconds just to look over it. Let's close the poll and have a look at some of the results. Okay, there we go. And so as you can see, most common is neither. Okay. <laughs> well, that's, well, that's, that's, that's happening. Yeah, that's really good. Um, although we do have some people that um, have raised a concern about a charity. I, I presume not necessarily about their own. Mm -hmm. um, eight have known that they've had one raised about them. And, eight percent, yeah. Eight percent, both. Okay, interesting. Okay, let's move on. So, some more statistics. This time about money. This time about money. Um, so, uh, of the animal welfare charities that we're looking at today, 70% um, of animal welfare charities are endorsed as deductible gift recipients by the Australian Taxation Office. Um, so that's where if people are giving them donations, those individuals can claim it back from their tax. Okay, right, yeah. yep. 89% um, are small charities. So when we talk about small, medium and large charities, we're looking at their uh, revenue. So small is under $250,000 a year. Yep. Um, the average income of those small charities is 63500 per charity, which okay. is still quite a lot. Yeah. But if you look at the graph underneath, you'll see the vast majority are still under $50,000 a year. Yeah, right. So, so there's just a few dragging that, that, that figure up on that yeah, average. Yeah, right. And I guess maybe most of our audience would feel like 63500 is probably beyond what they've got, but yeah. it's probably represented in this graph down the bottom. Yeah, so there'll be some some larger small charities that, as I said, will pull that that statistic up. The vast majority have under 50K a year to, yeah. to sort of achieve their purpose. Okay, and how about people, the people that make up these charities? So looking at animal welfare charities that we currently have registered, there's a combined total of about 2,831 paid employees um, and vastly outweighing that, there's 12,300 odd volunteers. Yeah, right. So it's 25 odd volunteers per charity. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. So a few interesting things about that. The, the broader charity sector as a whole usually has about twice the number of volunteers they do to paid employees. So the animal welfare charity uh, charity sector so has 4.5 times more volunteers. Wow. So there's a lot of people kind of volunteering yeah. within that space. In comparison to the rest of the charity yeah, sector. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Okay. Maybe that does resonate with our, with our audience too. And just before we get into some of the details about some of the concerns, we thought we couldn't do a, a webinar on animal welfare charities without showing some of the uh, precious fur babies of our office. That's um, right. On the left here we have a little puppy called Whiskey, who is the the precious one of one of our colleagues here at the office. Um, who else have we got? Julia? Uh, that, that kitten is my kitten, Hero, and he was adopted from an animal welfare charity. Okay, right. Yeah. And the little guinea pig down the bottom, that's Pip. So Pip is Alex's little guinea pig, uh, also a rescue. So. Excellent. All right. Now getting into some of the concerns commonly reported to the ACNC. Um, let's go through these one at a time. We've got, a, we've got a few to touch on. So as it says on the screen, animal welfare charities have the highest prevalence of concerns um, than any other subsector, I suppose. Um, and there's a couple of you know possible reasons for that that we'll discuss later. Um, so for about every 100 charities registered uh, as animal welfare charities, there's about 9.4 concerns. And that's compared with the broader charity sector where there's about 2.05, so about two two to every 100. Yeah, right, okay. Um, 
Animal welfare charities also have a higher number of multiple concerns per charity. So instead of... Oh, okay. So you mean what one charity getting a whole bunch of people say a few things about yeah, it rather yeah. than... Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. right. Um, which is more prominent with animal welfare charities than other parts of the charity sector, which is really interesting. Yeah, okay. Um, so when we say concern, um, typically we've got a raise a concern about a registered charity form, which is the form 6A you'll see as an see example there. there. Yep. So they typically come from members of the general public or or people who are involved in the organisation, volunteers, yep. or other people who have sort of an interest in, in what the organisations are doing. Okay. And just incidentally, if you did want to raise a concern about a charity, that form, it is a, a, a replication of a real form, and you can find it there at the website down the bottom, acnc.gov.au forward slash raise a concern, as one word, you'll find a copy of that form. And it's just some background information about the types of concerns we can look into, but if you do have something you want to raise with us, that's the form you want to you want to find. Okay, so let's move on to another poll. Yep, so we're going to just ask about, um, so I've just said, you know, it's disproportionately high for animal welfare charities to have concerns. We've seen that most people, 73% of people who are here in today's webinar haven't raised a concern, nor have they had a concern raised about their charity, which is fantastic. But we were going to ask you, why you think that animal welfare charities um, have disproportionately high results uh, when it comes to this concerns being raised about them compared to the broader charity sector. So if you just take a minute to respond to the poll. We've got far, four, oh, <laughs> five options there, There's a four and, and another one. Uh, lots of contact with the public. High passion but limited experience in running an organisation might be a case. High degree of public scrutiny and um, expectations. Just a general lack of time and resources. Or do you think it might be all of the above? Well, there we go. We're almost done. Almost everyone's voted. Let's close the poll. We'll have a look at the results. Okay, there we go. Uh, what have we got? Oh, well, interesting. almost half of you said all of the above, mm. which is probably to be expected, I would have thought. Yeah. yeah. So there are a few common reasons why things are brought to our attention, just to get you thinking. But yeah. interestingly, high passion, limited experience in running an organisation is um, the second one. Well, if you take out all of the above, it's the one with the most, yeah, yeah. The, the, the greatest number of results. So I suppose when we're looking at those figures about volunteers and the fact that there's a lot of volunteers out there volunteering in these animal welfare organisations, that, that might yeah. be why that rings a bit true. Okay, let's move on. Julia, take it away. Thanks, Matt. Yes, there's um, some common types of concerns that we receive. I'll go through those. So private benefit, for example, um, one of the charity's responsible persons is using it, the van for personal um, errands. So private benefit is when you're using the charity's funds or resources for your own benefit. Yep. Um, responsible persons, I'll, I'll just oh, yeah, define just that, that term. That's like board members or committee members. Okay, so it's not it's not just someone who's there that's pretty responsible. It's someone no, it's who someone has a who... formal decision making role within the organisation. That's right. Like a, a treasurer, a board member, or a committee member, or something. Correct. Director. Director. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Right. What about uh, the next one? Yeah, financial mismanagement. So people raise this kind of concern with us as well. Um, for an example there, uh, you've run a barbecue at Bunnings to raise some money for the charity and not all their donations have uh, made their way uh, into the bank account or they're not all recorded as having oh, okay. made their way there. Yep. Um, About the next one? Yep, a lack of accountability to members. So um, an a having an AGM is a way that people can ask questions about your charity and find out what's been going on. Um, and when people don't have one, we sometimes get concerns raised with us. Not following governing documents is another one. So uh, uh, your governing documents might define how many committee members you need to have uh, and there might not be enough. Right. The governing documents, I'll just define that, yeah, uh, sure. Matt, as well. So that could be your constitution, your rules, your articles of association, okay. perhaps a trustee. So it's the... Um, it's, uh, the thing that sets up what the organisation does and how it runs and its processes. And, That's and that's right. Usually, a, you said like a constitution or rules of association. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's quite an important document. 
Um, sometimes concern, uh, the concern that the charity is not pursuing its charitable purpose is raised with us. So maybe the charity is not ha uh, helping animals uh, like it's supposed to be. The public could feel like they're being misled. Um, for example, um, you're using a photo of, uh, that you've used previously on social media to fundraise for donations and you're using it again and people know that that uh, animal has actually been adopted. Right. Uh, internal disputes as well. So um, when committee members can't agree perhaps on, uh, you know, how they want to move the organisation forward, here's an example of a proposal to manage the, um, the local council pound. People are in disagreement and we get complaints raised okay. with us. Uh, and the next, the last one I have here is service provision. So not following your own um, policies or procedures. So, for example, someone adopts an, ex uh, an animal, they'd like to give it back. Your returns policy says they can within two weeks, but you don't allow them to do that. Right. They okay. might ring us. Okay. Plenty of types of concerns that Plenty. are raised with the ACNC, but one that pops up fairly regularly is um, concerns about the behaviour of people involved in animal welfare charities. Um, Beth, can you just give us an overview of what we mean by this? Because we've, we've made it a specific section here. So what are we talking about when we say concerns about behaviour? Yeah, so that's the way that people who are representing the charity, um, you know, to the public are perceived as being, as perceived as acting. So it may be on, on Facebook, um, or on the web page or any other sort of public sphere or even internally the way that they're, they're dealing with other committee members or volunteers. Um, so, you know, we can receive allegations of bullying and harassment, um, especially on social media, given the the time we live in where, you know, all organisations tend to have like a, a social media presence yep. and it's in the public sphere, it's out there. So that's something that comes up quite a lot. Um, Clients might be unhappy with the service that a charity has provided. Um, so for animal welfare charities, I suppose that's, you know, the expectations of somebody who wants to adopt a, a puppy, for example, from an yep. organisation and they weren't happy with the process or the waiting okay. period or, yep. you know, these organisations can be underfunded, under, yes. you know, resourced with yeah. all their volunteers. So, it, you know, it's not a immediate thing and the public might get frustrated that they didn't get their puppy straight away yep. and you guys are doing the best you can. So it can get quite heated. Yep. Um, clients might be unhappy with the way that their concerns or complaints have been handed, handled toward, like by the actual organisation. Uh, okay. yep. So before we even hear about it, they might have tried to resolve it directly with the organisation mm. and it hasn't been resolved to their satisfaction. And by the time it comes to the ACNC, there's already been a bit of back and forth between the client and the animal welfare charity yeah, exactly. and it's already risen to a, a certain point. Yeah, it's already escalated. Um, and on top of that as well, um, disputes between charity staff and clients or charity staff and other staff. So we get quite a range really. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, now an important thing to remember is the serious effects that this sort of thing may have on a charity? Yeah, so especially if these, you know, happen in the public sphere, like on Facebook, um, they can have some real flow on effects. So, you know, lots of support and donations. These organisations run very much on volunteers, as we looked at earlier, and, um, you know, donations from the public. Yeah. So if, if their reputation is damaged because of one particular incident, it can have a huge impact on your ability to actually pursue your charitable purpose yeah, and, right. you, know, you know, save the animals that you want to yeah. save. Yes. Um, so that can have consequences not just with fundraising and volunteers but loss of business okay yeah. so maybe the people will you know have a little bit less trust and maybe they'll go elsewhere if they're wanting to rescue yeah, an right. animal or something along those lines or even grants yeah if it's in the public sphere it's searchable by grant makers oh, that's right. yeah. 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 People are looking at a bunch of organizations that are all trying to get to that same grant money the last thing you want is any sort of mud on your name based yeah. on this sort of behaviour. And it can be really critical if it's impairing your ability to find good homes for the animals if of you're course. if you're doing rehoming activities. So that can be a real problem. 
All right, just to break things up again, some more nice animal pictures. Um, Beth, I'll let you start because there's one of your precious ones there. <laughs> uh, so that lovely parrot there on the left, um, that's my rescue parrot, Echo. So he's on his third home now. Hopefully right. he will stay with me forever if I have anything to do with it. Um, down the bottom there, that's Liliana. That's um, Pip's friend. So okay. that's, we saw uh, Pip before. We yeah. saw Pip before. Um, up top there, that's Sammy. And to the very right-hand side, that is Lexa and Bobby. And they own our staff members, Bree and Sean. Right. So Plenty of um, cute little pets. Gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sure everyone thinks their own pet is the cutest, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, we mentioned concerns that were often raised um, with the ACNC about animal welfare charities, and there's quite a range, as we saw. And then the concerns about behaviour that pop up and are really detrimental to a charity's operations. Not everything that raise, is raised with the ACNC is something that we can look into. We have legislation by which we're bound and we can only um, look into certain things. Um, Julia, can you just take us through what sorts of concerns may lead to investigation? So the stuff that, you know, whilst we might have uh, dealt with some of the concerns um, initially on the phone or by email or yes. with some advice, some more serious stuff gets a bit further down the line, doesn't it? Sure, it does. So uh, some of the more serious stuff, as Matt has described it, um, could breach our legislation and um, could lead to potentially serious consequences. So I'll talk you through those things and what we have seen. Um, so private benefit, again, uh, and an example there could be using the charity's funds to pay your own personal bills. Right. Using the charity's credit card to buy things for yourself, yep. uh, which could also raise quite serious issues around um, fraud and theft yep. within the charity. Um, accountability to members, again, we're more likely to investigate where there's no accountability evident. Okay. When you say this, this might mm. be a phrase that's a bit tricky for people mm. to, to get their heads around. What, what sort of things... I guess if we look in the reverse, what things are being accountable to your members? Well, sure. What is being accountable to your members? Sure. So being um, one of the most common ways that people are can demonstrate to us they're accountable to their members is by holding an AGM, where you talk about what activities you've run in the last 12 months. Right. You give people access to your financials. You give them the opportunity to raise questions with you and you answer questions and give people, right. inf members, information about your charity. So it's providing the opportunities for the people involved in the charity to, to know what's going on, That's to right. ask questions of the people that are running the charity, to have a sort of an open an open process. Yeah, it's yep. transparent. Um, people can also put information, that sort of information, on their website mm -hmm. or or any other way they can think of getting it out there right. to um, to to increase their transparency. Okay. Record keeping um, is another uh, issue that uh, might lead us to investigate. Again, it demonstrates what you're doing within the charity. So uh, you're required to keep um, records of your operational and financial decisions. Right. That way you can demonstrate you're compliant with um, the ACNC yep. um, legislation and regulations as well as what you're doing uh, yep. with, with the public's money. Yeah, and, right. um, and that's a really important thing when you're a registered charity. And I suppose that if you're keeping those operational and financial records, if members are asking questions about decisions that you've made, you, you have the records to show them how you reached that That's point. That's right. So, That's right. Yeah. And, you can, and you can plan for the future of your charity as well because uh, you know what's been going on within the charity, how much money you've got, where you're spending it and those sorts of things. Yeah, it's a good practice beyond just you know, ticking a box to make sure you're doing the right thing that the regulator tells that's you to right, do. It actually that's right. is beneficial for your organisation to do all these things. That's right. Your knock-on effects that it will help you later. Yes. What about the fourth one here? The fourth one uh, um, uh, is we see a failure of responsible pe persons to fulfil their duties. So those duties are outlined clear, clearly in our governance standards and really uh, they include that you must act in the best interests of the charity. So when you're making decisions, think about um, 
the best interests of the charity and how it might look to someone else. Yeah. There's lots of, sorry, sorry, I was just going to say there's lots of resources on our website about the governance standards and I think there was also recently another webinar that people might like to look at if they're interested in more information there. Yeah, we'll we'll include links to some of these resources in the follow-up email that you'll all get after the webinar once we've recorded and published and whatnot, we'll send you a follow-up email with a bunch of links to some useful resources including that webinar on governance that Julie just mentioned. And how about the fifth dot point here? This is an important one. It is. Um, So charities um, have a duty to notify us when they change their name or their address, when they change uh, who are the responsible persons for the organisation. So if you have a change of committee members or board members, you need to let us know. And, uh, and they're published on the register so people know who are responsible for your charity. Also, if your constitution changes, you need to let us know about that. Yeah, exactly right. There's a couple of links there on the bottom right-hand corner that you can see which um, will have an, an overview of what Julie just mentioned there about the obligations. And the one underneath that is specific to court governance standard five which covers the duties of responsible persons. So if you wanted to have a look at that and, um, uh, you know, read more um, in more depth about these obligations, then you should go to the website at acnc.gov.au forward slash obligations or for responsible persons, acnc.gov.au forward slash G-O-V-S-T-D-5. It's a shorthand for governance standard number five. Okay. When investigations do proceed, Mm. what sort of action um, can the ACNC take? So there are a number of actions that the ACNC can take um, when we let, when uh, in response to the outcomes of an investigation. One of the things we do where the breaches are less serious and the charity um, has show, shows a willingness to work with us to improve its governance and the way the, op, the charity is run, is um, we'll walk, work with the charity to improve uh, processes and procedures, record keeping and those sorts of things. And often when we do that, we are a charity, uh, we walk away and the charity is stronger for it. Yeah. Well, that's our, our hope right, anyway, yeah. our intention. Um, We can issue warnings or enforceable undertakings, penalties. We can um, refer matters to other regulators if it's outside our jurisdiction. So we might refer very serious matters to the police. We um, might refer matters that are regarding um, the mistreatment of animals to the RSPCA. Yeah. Um, the most serious cases, we revoke the charity's um, registration, so yep. we'll take away their ability to be a charity. Um, look, generally, we expect that people will do the right thing, and, yep. it, and it's quite a serious topic that we're discussing, but, but we do generally expect people will do the right thing. But where they don't and they seriously or deber- deliberately breach the legislation, then then we act. Yeah. Um, and that. That last point, if we do revoke a charity status, can have some serious flow-on effects to a charity as well, such as potential loss of tax concessions. And, you know, when we looked at the funding earlier, the, the money that is in small charities especially, there's not a lot there to begin with. So that's that's quite a serious thing. Yes. yes. Yeah, loss of tax concessions can really hit a small charity hard. And also beyond that, if you lose your charity registration, that's public knowledge too. The last thing you want is people to be able to see your see that your organisation has been stripped of its charity status. It has mm. a, a really significant effect to your to the reputation of your organisation yes. as well, which in and of itself will have knock-on effects to finances yeah. because people will be less likely to donate, I would assume. Um, okay, let's have a look at a couple of case studies to bring all of this information to um, how it may play out in the real world. But before we get to it, I might just say this. This is just a case study. It's not based on a real investigation. The learnings of it are. Um, it's based on just some stuff we've learned over the five years, but Cat Rescue and, and the details of, of the charity itself are um, uh, just for uh, illustrative purposes. Correct, yeah. <laughs> Beth, can you take us through what happened with Cat Rescue? So Cat Rescue, um, there were some allegations made 
yep. to ACNC about cat rescue. Uh, the allegations were that the charity's funds were being used to pay the rent and other personal expenses right. um, of the responsible person, so the directors or the committee members. Um, there was uh, information provided saying that there was no clear separation of charity money and personal money. Okay. So right. when we were talking about record keeping earlier, this yeah. is one of those reasons it's important. So people were having money, donations come in, but it was all kept in the same maybe the same bank same account, bank account as or the yes. owner or the, the chairman. Yeah, or perhaps. Yeah. So that was the the impression that the, the persons or people who yep. reported this were under. Um, and despite the fact that in their constitution um, it, it was a requirement, the cat rescue was said to not be holding any sort of meetings and that they didn't actually have any other members. It was oh, quite okay. yeah, so closely they, held. It was just a small group yeah. of people. So, so even though their constitution said they needed, say, five committee members as, as being an incorporated association or whatever it may be. Perhaps they had two. They exactly, had two. yeah. Okay. So that was what was reported to us. Um, okay, and when we had a look at it and um, got in a little bit deeper and saw some of the details, what did we find, Julia? We found that uh, in actual fact the charity did have some records uh, to show that its funds were being spent on charitable purposes. Okay. purposes. So that does demonstrate how important it is to have those records. So it they were able to the answer questions that, from us. So that it appeared from the outside that there was something dodgy going Correct. on. The records didn't show to, to just a supporter or someone from the public that the money was kept separate, but in actual fact it it was. It was. Yeah. Well, well, it wasn't kept separate, but the charity could satisfy us right. that the money that was coming in for the charity was also being spent on the charity. Right. Based so on the record keeping. Based on the record have. keeping. And they worked to Im – it wasn't ideal, but they worked to improve their record keeping so that uh, that same issue couldn't be raised right. okay. again. Yep. And uh, it, it makes good sense to keep your money separate from the charity's money. Yeah. They set up some new and um, better record keeping procedures uh, and a bank account in the name of the charity to, yep. to really delineate those things. Um, the charity also elected more people to the committee and started holding regular meetings. It is something that we see quite a bit with animal welfare charities. They're started by often by family and friends who are really passionate about what they do, which is yep. excellent. However, sometimes um, issues arise because everyone knows each other. Yep. And to people looking into the charity, they may um, fear that they aren't holding each other accountable because right. they know each other and there might be conflicts of interest. Yep. People might not be making decisions in the best interests of the charity. Yep. So we would we would advise people to consider having someone from outside of your family group or your friendship group come onto your board or your committee and it just uh, it will assist your accountability with fresh eyes yep. and also uh, it, the perception to the public is that you are, are being accountable and transparent. Yeah. And I suppose that's the thing as well is even if you're doing everything correctly and by the book, if that's not the perception the general public has, it can really impact your organisation, you, you know, your reputation and your ability to actually achieve what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, so, so it comes back to um, that point again about record keeping and processes. So if you, even if it does appear to be uh, from the outside, it appears that there are some conflicts of interest or the, you know, not enough accountability there. If you've got the clear processes, procedures and records to demonstrate that, notwithstanding that having more people on the board is a good thing, yes. but at least that is um, an important step in demonstrating that you are accountable. Yeah, Absolutely. you can answer those questions mm. when they're raised. Yeah. Let's have a look at one more. This one, not cats, bigger animals, horses incorporated. Um, Beth, do you want to take us through what happened with this case study? Uh, it was reported to the ACNC that the um, management committee were using their funds for gambling, which right. is pretty concerning. Um, the, they weren't providing um, or responding to requests for information about horses that were apparently up for adoption. Um, and the members were also suspicious about the use of funds and the charities committee members refusing to provide information to explain how the money was actually being used. Right. So, 
some um, fairly uh, serious allegations in this lot. Once we were able to have a look at it, what did we find, Julia? Well, we found um, some very, fairly serious issues. We found that the funds, uh, charities funds were being used uh, for restaurants, hotel rooms, home improvements. So they were clearly being uh, not used, not being used for charitable purposes right. and they were being uh, spent as private funds. Yep. Um, and the, that's not restaurants for the horses. I no, that's so. right. That's <laughs> right. Um, the committee members were paying themselves above market rates and there was no account and accountability for the work they were doing. So no, no one knew exactly what they were doing or why they were paying themselves some funds. So if they needed to get something done, whatever it may be for the charity, rather than going out and looking for service providers who can do that work at, at a certain price and figuring out which one works best for the charity at, you know, at a good price and is yes. using the charity money responsibly, they just decided that they would pay themselves a bit above what they could get That's externally right. and That's still right. not have any accountability for the work that they did. That's right. right. And really when you're looking at making decisions in the best interests of the charity, no one could say that that is a decision that's made in the best interests of the charity. Right. Uh, they also used services of their family and friends to, despite them being uh, more expensive. Yep. And look, there's nothing wrong with using the services of people that you know, but you need to make sure you're getting best value for the charity's money and, and be able to demonstrate it. So if anyone asks you the question, you can say, well, actually, we've got these three quotes here. This one came in as the cheapest mm -hmm. or just some way of demonstrating that you've acted with care and due diligence and in the best interests of the charity. Again, so it's not that there's anything inherently wrong with this. We imagine right. that some organisations in well, country towns or particularly rural areas yes. might often not have an option because, you know, they know most of the people and yeah. they're family friends. So Maybe yeah. there's only one vet in one the town. One vet and they're right. related. Yeah, yeah. So it's not that there's inherently anything wrong with using the services of people that you know. Again, it's all about the record keeping, the, the accountability and transparency about the processes by which you came to use that person's services. That's right. That's right. Well, the last point here is that the charity refused to cooperate with the ACNC. So you can't say uh, that you're acting in the best interest of, the, of your charity if you're not cooperating with the regulator. And we are tasked with maintaining trust and confidence in the charitable sector. And so we needed to act in the way that was appropriate for the concerns raised that we verified via the investigation. And so that charity's registration was revoked. Pretty serious outcome, which as we mentioned, will have had um, ramifications on their tax concessions and, and their financial standing. Really. And reputation. That's right, and, and their reputation, reputation. yes. Yeah. You, you, that's one thing we probably can't stress enough, how important a charity's reputation is, but then again, how fragile it is at the same mm -hmm. time. Yes. And silly mistakes and s silly behaviour in the public eye, especially on social media, can really hit your reputation hard. And it's really difficult to recover from that, especially if you've taken years sometimes even decades, to build a, a really solid reputation on trust. Yes. To have it knocked down with some bad behaviour is really um, a bad way, uh, a bad position to be in. Yes. Hard to build, easy to break. Yes. Unfortunately. Okay. Um, having listened to all this, in light of all of this, what can people in charities do? So we've highlighted a bunch of common problems and what often pops up. Uh, what are some practical things that people in charities can actually do to avoid this or, or mitigate against this sort of thing? Uh, well, firstly, as we've been saying, is keep good records. Yep. Be thorough. Keep financial records, keep operational records, records of decisions. Um, if you're doing the right thing, it's not a problem. But if you have the records to prove it, then if any questions come up in future, you're doing yourself a massive favour. So keep good records. More records are better than... Not enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, not a problem having too many records. That's it. But you will get into trouble if you don't have enough. <laughs> How about the next one? Uh, the next one, uh, follow your charity's rules outlined in your governing document. Um, ensure that you handle complaints appropriately and that your charity is accountable to members. And you'll probably find some guidance in relation to those things in your governing rules. 
Next one, Beth. Make sure the people who are responsible for running your organisation know and understand their responsibilities. So right. if you're a company, when a new director comes on board, make sure they are aware of everything they need to be aware of. If you're an incorporated association, when your treasurer is appointed, when your secretary is appointed, make sure they're brought up to speed and they're aware of exactly what they need to know. It sounds simple and it sounds like something that everyone would be doing, but surprisingly, we hear lots of stories and anecdotes which suggest that people aren't doing this as well as they could be. Yeah, so I suppose um, one of the points we touched on earlier is, uh, you know, a lot of people who start these organisations are really driven by the passion of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I personally, I'm all about rescue parrots and that's that's one of my passions but I wouldn't know where to begin necessarily if I started being treasurer for an organization right. so the two don't always go hand in hand so this this step is really important is make sure the people who need to know how to run your organization know what they need to know so new members you could perhaps give them an induction pack yeah run absolutely. them through some training do a handover with the old treasurer Try and set them up as best as you can so that they can responsibly um, act in their position. Yep. Yep. And making sure, just the point above as well, is making sure everybody's read the governing document. Yes. So new yes. members, new, new responsible persons, read the constitution. How about the next one, the fourth dot point there, Julia? Uh, we've talked a lot today about protecting your reputation and how valuable and important that is. So... Uh, We'll just rem remind uh, you again about that. And also um, we've um, we've given you a tip sheet, I believe, in relation to we using. Oh, we will do. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. We will give you a tip sheet about using social media online and that might be able to help with some, some issues that can arise with using social media, which a lot of animal welfare charities do. That might be a good place to start. And it is such a good tool to, to reach out and, you know, find homes or volunteers or so it's, it's absolutely not that, you know, organisations shouldn't be using the tools that they have. Just having some forethought and some processes and some procedures on on how to do that is, yeah. is really yeah. crucial. And, and making sure it's not used to air out your dirty laundry in, in public, so to speak. Yeah, yeah and that's definitely tarnish your reputation. Yeah. And what about this um, next point? Keep your personal finances separate from the charities and have really good financial controls in place. Um, so, again, this is this is about record keeping. This is about accountability if questions come up, having a bank account in your organisation's name, making sure you're keeping a track of where money is being spent and what it's being spent on. Um, and just to cover yourselves, if, in case questions are, arise later, then you can go back to your records and you can demonstrate exactly what's happened. Really important. Yeah. Um, the second to last one, Julia. Ah. Ensure decisions are made in the best interests of the charity. So think about the charity whenever you make a decision. Yeah. Have rules for how you make decisions and record your decisions and ha how you made them so you can evidence that you thought about the impact on the charity and how it would benefit from the decisions you were making. And lastly? Uh, probably a bit of a reiteration, but have policies and procedures. Have a conflict of interest policy to know how you'll handle a conflict of interest when yeah. they arise. Yes. Because conflicts of interest will happen. They're yep. not a bad thing. It's how you manage them and how you document them. That's, That's a really important. important point. They're not necessarily a bad thing. It's going to happen. We know lots of people. We come across Absolutely. lots of people. Absolutely, so all the time. It's just a matter of, as Beth said, having the processes in place to be able to deal with it, deal with it openly, transparently, and record how it happened, record what happened and how the decision was made. And that mm. way... A conflict of interest doesn't need to be um, something that um, holds your charity back or gets your charity in trouble. That's right. I have guidelines for social media. Yeah. All of these things will help um, just cover yourself if, if issues arise in the future. So policies and procedures. Okay. Um, we're just going to give you another poll. Having heard all of this... What is the, the next poll is going to ask you... Four choice, uh, sorry, five choices here. 
What is the first thing you're going to do to make sure your charity is staying on track, having heard all of this information? It's got a few options. Re, uh, sorry, Find and read your charity's governing document. Make sure you've got information for new staff and volunteers. Review your procedures for managing finances. We've spoken a fair bit about that today. Review how you use social media. Again, we can't reiterate the importance of this. That is stuff that's playing out in the public realm, so just bear that in mind. And finally, implement new policies and procedures. Now, this may be about anything. It may be um, you don't have a conflicts of interest policy, so you realise that well, we really need to get that. Or maybe you think your uh, financial management procedure is a little weak, so you need to strengthen it. So the last one there is sort of a, a catch-all, which um, may be applied to your organisation specifically. A few more seconds to answer that, and then we'll close the poll and give you all a look at the results. Okay, let's close the poll and we'll share the results with everyone. Let's have a look. Got the most one is uh, the last option, the catch-all, which is reasonable enough because you yes. can apply that to your own organisation's yes. um, areas. But interestingly, the second one, make sure you've got information for new staff and volunteers. That's great. Quite highly. Mm. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, and then what's the third one there, Matt? Find this, and read your, your charity's, charities governing, governing documents. documents. Um, I wonder how many people even know where their mm. governing document is. Yeah. That's that's another question. And look, they're not riveting, I'll be honest, but yeah. definitely worthwhile knowing exactly what important. they say. Very mm. important. Mm. Okay. The uh, last couple of um, bits to go over today. Oh, but of course, first we can't we can't move on until we have a look at the last set of um, cute little animals. So again, these are all rescue animals of the AC and C. Um, that's a little Raffi up top there in the left, Ruby with the big grin there in the middle, Molly, and down the bottom there on the left hand side, that's little Enzo, the Wonderbird. Yours. Great name. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Any questions? This is your chance. I know you've been um, getting some questions from, uh, sorry, getting some answers as we go through from Alex and Amanda in the other room via text. But if you've got any questions now that you've seen the formal presentation that you want to send through, please do so. We're, um, we're going to try and get through as many as we can. But as I said, there's quite a few in the audience today, so we, won't, we probably won't be able to get to all of them. If we don't get to yours, um, we will get back to you via email. Um, let's see what we've... Let's see, we've got uh, just a second. One's come through. Oh, we, we have touched on this a bit, but it's worth asking because um, a few people have asked it. What do you recommend for a succession plan or a smooth transition between boards and committees? Beth, do you want to have a go at that one? Yeah, so first and foremost, it comes back to reading your constitution or rules or articles of association. Uh, so usually your governing document will have um, guidelines about you know, electing new committee or board members um, and when those people's appointments will take effect. Often there's a crossover period between the old committee members and the new committee members. Right. Um, and that crossover period can be really useful in handover, yep. like we've said, having an induction pack, um, having a, a, any meetings to make sure you don't lose the yeah. knowledge of, you know, your really experienced people when, when new people are coming in. And it can be something as simple as, you know, a, f a few checklists and that sort of thing, right? Yes. So something just to get them um, in the right frame of mind and knowing yep. the sort of um, the basic things that they must cover. Yeah, yeah, and then something they can refer back to if it's a physical thing or a, a digital thing. Yeah. You know, they can refer back to it later in time just to double check that they're across everything. Yep. Um, so it doesn't need to be um, – we say something like induction pack, and it sounds very fancy. It, it doesn't does, need it's to not. be fancy. It can be, yeah, as you say, um, a digital thing or, or a physical thing, a bunch of notes, a checklist, a little handbook that, that yep. helps the person through, but also – have a chat with them, meet with them, take the time to run them through things rather than throwing them in the deep end. And I know that most small charities don't have much time and taking the time out to do this sort of thing feels like it's taking time away from the things you want to be doing rescuing animals, but 
it can't be understated, uh, overstated that and this is really important. It will save time in the future. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having a handbook for your organisation is a great a great tool if you can pull one together yeah. as well. So again, it doesn't need to be fancy. Just a few things, the important yep. things that people need to know. Your vision, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, another question's come through. It's sort of related, a little bit different focus, but we'll, we'll touch on that. Um, someone's asked. Uh, that they have many volunteers in their organisation. How can they maintain good practices with so many volunteers, especially given that most of their volunteers are part-time, short-term or, or really casual, you know, once a month or, or something mm. like that? What do you well, recommend? I mean, along the same vein is, is throwing back to having a, a little pack of information that you can sit down with with new volunteers and, and hand out is, is really, really useful. Um, also, in most states and territories, there is a peak body for volunteering. Okay. Um, so, you know, if you want to get in touch with the, your peak body for volunteering uh, in your state and territory, they have a lot of great already pre-prepared resources for volunteers mm -hmm. um, that covers things they need to know. Yeah, go to that user. And we'll include some um, links to some of those organisations and the ones that we know of that um, in the follow-up email following this yep. webinar um, and you know with any new volunteer or new responsible person there's also the opportunity to review things nothing like a pair of fresh eyes to go through and point out where perhaps you could make some improvements exactly yeah. rather than doing it the way that it's always been done which yeah. might not be the best way yeah. so take that opportunity as well fresh eyes yeah that's it um, Okay, what else have we got? Oh, just a quick one. Someone's asked about the obligations to the ACNC. What um, what things, what stuff do they need to report to the ACNC? And we did mention brief, um, earlier on that there was an obligation to notify of changes. Um, what do animal charities have to do? And I might just throw an add on to that question. Uh, the obligations of animal welfare charities, any different to other registered charities with the ACNC? Who wants to have a go at that one? Well, there's no no difference between animal welfare charities and any other form of charities. Right. <laughs> so today we've just been talking about what we commonly see with animal welfare charities. But, but the there's no difference the in the ob obligations. Okay. So, and what are the obligations? Yeah, the, look, the obligations are the duty to notify that we um, discussed earlier about changes to name and address and responsible people and governing documents. You also need to report uh, in your AIS annually annual, to us. Annual information statement. For That's right. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, <laughs> <at> an acronym. <laughs> yeah. um, and financial reports as well, depending on your size. So that's depending on your revenue per year. Okay. Yeah. So just to put that in, I suppose, context of why it's important, not just for us and us fulfilling our role as a regulator about why you have to tell us this stuff, it's um, why it's important for you as a registered charity is if you have outdated information, if you haven't told us about your directors changing or if you're not submitting your annual information statement, that is freely available information to any member of the general public who cares to look it up on the charity register. And, you know, if they're deciding whether to donate their time or money between two registered charities and they look them both up and one has fulfilled its regulatory obligations to us and the other one has not, I know which one I would be giving it's my time and money to. a choice in that mm. yeah. situation. So if, if for no other reason, that's the reason you should be doing yeah. it. And we know how, um, how much the public does look into um, animal welfare charities. As you said earlier, it's a... It's an um, area that evokes lots of emotion and people feel very passionately about the work of animal welfare charities. So um, members of the public are inclined to look up each one and look up the details to see that they are doing the right thing. And as you say, Beth, if there's one that seems to be doing things better than the other, it makes it a pretty easy choice where the money's going to go. Yeah. Um, right. Um, social media keeps popping up. Um, we've got a question. Someone says that they, their organisation's had some issues on social media, um, but they recognise that it's the main means of communication with the public and their supporters and even um, an important tool for fundraising. Do we have any tips for social media, anything that they should or shouldn't do? Did any you know, ideas? Do you wanna... uh, well, I think um, have a look at our social media tip sheet that's going to come out yeah. after this we'll, we'll send that webinar shortly. <laughs> um, have rules for resolving 
conflict and who who operates your social media accounts what they can put on your social media accounts and how you respond to issues that are raised by the public on your social media account so if it's all laid out um, they would be it's easier to manage any potential conflict that might happen online um, we meant the the question mentioned issues um, we see that a fair bit don't we Beth that issues are played out on social media um, is the reminder that this is public is that one of the key points Ah, uh, definitely I think with anything that is you know open and freely available on the internet um, there's a little bit of an inclination with many people to speak their mind and sometimes that maybe not have the forethought about the impact that that's going to have um, and the long-term impact the because long you can impact. look things up and see posts and, yeah. and comments yes. years later they, they become almost effectively mm. um, uh, permanent don't they and well People nothing goes away once green shot them so, as well yeah. can't yeah, they take them out of context and it can really blow out of control very quickly so when julia mentioned having you know a process in place and knowing who has access to your social media accounts um you know you might never be the one to who's likely to blow up on the internet but you know, perhaps in the future you'll have a committee member who's just having a bad day and yep. says something flippantly or is taken out of context when something's in writing. It can be lose its tone. Yep. Perhaps yes. it was just a, a mm. bad joke that fell flat. Yep. But, um, again, when you're dealing with the reputation of your charity, you can't take that lightly. Yeah, it takes ages to build and it takes a second to destroy. Yes. So <laughs> guard it very carefully. Mm. So along with our tips sheet on um, managing social media, there is a really great resource, um, a guide, a social media guide um, from Justice Connect. Um, and they're a, a not-for-profit organisation who have a whole lot of resources for other not-for-profit organisations. So I do encourage you to check that out on their website yep. and we'll send around a link. We'll send around a link for that one. And just um, there are some resources here on your screen. Um, we may have to start wrapping things up because we have ticked over to one o'clock already. That went really quickly and oh, wow. we're sort of running out of time. So any of the questions that we didn't get to um, today, we will, I promise, uh, cover via email, but we will um, we will um, hang around online to chat and answer a few of the questions coming through um, for, for five or, or ten minutes or so as they do. But while I've still got you, the resources here on the on the website, uh, sorry, on the screen from our website that may be useful for you, we will send in a follow up email too. But I'll just point them out. Um, some interesting and useful guides from us. Governance for Good is all about how to govern a charity, conflicts of interest, managing conflicts of interest, which we spoke about before, and some templates for use in your, your meetings and your um, annual general meetings and that sort of thing. Our community is a, um, a social enterprise that um, has lots of information um, for not-for-profits that recommend going there. Justice Connect, as Beth just mentioned, and even the taxation office, we noticed that there are a few questions in the in people's registrations that were asking about um, DGR endorsement and tax concessions and whatnot. That is the realm of the ATO. And um, although some tax concessions require registration as a charity, um, the decision on the tax concession itself and, and the conditions upon that tax concession rest with the ATO. So we recommend having a look at their section specifically um, uh, designed for not-for-profits. There's a link there which we'll include in the email. Um, finally, this is just some stuff to stay in touch with all our news and updates and webinars and things like this if you want to. There's, we're big on social media and um, if you want to ask any questions about your charity and any of the issues we, wait, we raised today, um, give us a call on 132262 we're happy to help over the phone or send us an email, advice at acnc.gov.au. And I know you're all hungry, as am I, so we want to get some lunch. <laughs> this is the last slide, I promise. Um, sign up for future webinars at acnc.gov.au forward slash webinars. And if you have any questions, comments or feedback about the webinars or other education material in particular, send an email to education acnc.gov.au, which is separate from the stuff you want to know about your charity, the <laughs> experts at the advice email address are probably the ones to answer those questions. And 
we will wrap up now, but we do have um, a three question survey at the end. You don't have to take it. It takes maybe 10 seconds. Um, once you close down the webinar, if you want to fill in that survey, we greatly appreciate it because it does shape how we go about future webinars. So much appreciated if you do take the time to um, complete that survey. Thank you very much. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, we everyone. We hope you got a lot out of today's webinar and um, get in touch with us if you want some more information about anything we, came, we covered today, particularly in regards to your um, charity. And thanks to Alex and Amanda who have been answering all the questions frantically in the other room. We will hang on the line for five or ten minutes to answer any of the questions that are still coming through, but for the meantime, the, this is the end of the presentation and um, we hope you enjoyed it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.